Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elisa Ewan, and I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Teachers College. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for our virtual program featuring alumna Stephanie Simpson. This program is brought to you by Alumni Relations as part of TC's Come Together Right Now virtually series. Although many of us are staying at home right now, we're so grateful to our alumni experts who have stepped forward to offer digital programs that will continue to bring the TC community together to learn, share, and connect with one another. Today, Stephanie will present Stress Management, Create a Practice that Works for You. Stephanie Simpson is a graduate of the Clinical Psychology Program with an emphasis in spirituality, mind, body, and a focus in organizational change. She is a coach, speaker, artist, and educator. Drawing on her background in movement, meditation, and psychology, she guides people to achieve their greatest potential in nurturing the connection between the mind, body, and spirit. With a focus on helping people find their true balance and align their authentic selves, Stephanie empowers them to live their lives unapologetically and to the fullest. She is also a certified yoga instructor. Before we begin, if you have any technical and, or audio issue, please feel free to chat me directly in the chat box. And without further ado, here's Stephanie. Thank you. Um, so it's wonderful to have you all with me. Um, I hope you're staying safe and healthy. So let's define stress. And I'm gonna have a great example now for this entire webinar. <laughs> so stress is a physical, mental, or emotional factor that causes bodily and mental or mental tension. So stresses can be external, something from the environment, psychological or social situations. So an example here would be the computer not working in the way that I wanted it to work could create a stress reaction if I allowed it to. Or they could be internal. So things like illness or something from a medical procedure and coming from the inside out. So in general, stress is our perceived um, ability, uh, inability to handle the situation that we are in, right? That things become so overwhelming and that we don't have the resources available to us to be able to succeed. And when we think of stress, we think of three different things. We have our stressor, our reactivity, and our strain. So I'm gonna quickly define those so that we can be clear on the terminology that we're gonna be using. So a stressor is anything that has the potential to trigger this flight, the fight or flight, and I'm gonna add freeze into that reaction in our body. And then the actual reactivity is that reaction. So a bunch of different hormones, the cortisol, uh, we can get sweaty, palms feeling like, you know, hot, all of that sort of stuff is the fight, flight, or freeze reaction. And then all of that in our body um, creates a strain, right? And strains can be behavioral, they can be emotional, they can be mental. So some examples of strains are headaches, backaches, um, feeling like lethargic or depressed, or maybe abusing things like alcohol or other types of drugs. So strains are the outcome of whatever the stress and the reactivity is. So let's get a little more clear on what the fight, flight, and freeze response is. So what happens is when we have a threat, right? So something comes up to us or a thing happens, right? So right now, the fact that like, oh my gosh, my presentation might not work and I might just have to talk to everybody without slides, right? That seems like a threat. And immediately our amygdala, so if you think of like our brain like this, our amygdala, we fly off the handle and it tells our hypothalamus like, oh gosh, something is happening. We either need to fight, we need to run away or we need to freeze. And it's gonna release things like cortisol and our heart rate is gonna get up, our blood pressure, our, pump it, our blood's gonna start pumping, we're gonna have adrenaline if we need to fight back or if we need to run, all of that sort of stuff that's really essential, um, especially way back in the day, like our reptilian brain, right? Like these are ways to protect ourselves. However, if we don't properly release all the stuff that's coming up, all the, these physiological things that are happening, they can cause harm down the line, especially repetition of the fight, flight, or freeze response. They weaken the immune system, which then 
becomes problematic in us being able to fight off the common cold or anything like that. So we really want to be able to recognize when this is happening and know when it's appropriate and when it's not. Moving on. All right, so one of the things about stress management is getting clear on what stress actually is versus worry and anxiety and fear. All right, so a lot of times when we're saying, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed out, we're actually not. Maybe we're just worried about something or maybe we're actually really afraid of something. So the earlier in the process we can get clear on what it is that is actually coming up for us, the more power we have to shift that situation or shift that narrative. So a fear is something that's untaught and is an instinctive reaction. So like I said, like it's this, it's the inner critic in us that's really protecting us. I also like to call it gremlin when I'm working with clients. It's this fear of failure, right? So a good example, let's take this idea of needing to get a job, right? And so going on a job interview, you might be really nervous and afraid of the job interview. Like, oh my gosh, what if they don't like me? What if I'm not good enough? All this idea of like, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, right? So that's the fear, the fear of failure. And then that can lead to worry, which are these repetitive and recurring thoughts. So, you know, the week leading up, you're like, oh, what if I don't have the answer to that question? What if I'm not right for the job? What if I say something wrong? What if I don't wear the right thing? All of those reoccurring thoughts begin to cause worry. And the more that we worry about things, then the thing can get so big that we feel stressed out, right? The other thing that comes into play is anxiety. So anxiety is an unwarranted or excessive fear. So maybe having the thought like, oh my gosh, if I don't get this job, I'm never gonna get a job and then I can't pay my bills and then how am I gonna pay my student loans or all of these things that start spiraling and snowballing that really there's, they're unwarranted. There's no fact that if you don't get this job, you're not going to get another job, right? So that's the difference between anxiety and worry, though both of those things, the more we do them can lead to stress, which again is our perceived inability to meet the demands that are placed upon us. So when creating a stress management um, protocol or your own sort of practice, we wanna be comprehensive about it. And so what that means is we wanna understand the source management, we wanna understand prevention, and then relaxation and thought management. And research shows that source management and prevention are really like the best things to try to do, right? Those are the things that we can do before the actual stress comes about. Relaxation and thought management are really great, though they don't have as much of an effect if we're not also thinking about source management and prevention, right? So if we're thinking of the things that stress us out, if we ask, like, where is this coming from? What is, what is, the, what is it that's creating this feeling inside of me that is making me worry? Where does that come from, all of that? Then we can reduce and eliminate it. Um, and we can't always eliminate everything, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but we can reduce things, right? And there are some sources of stress that we can eliminate completely. The other thing we can do is prevent things, right? So say you're working on a team and you have this big project that you're working on and you're timelining everything out. You can take the time to say, okay, what are some obstacles that may come up? What are some um, things that might add extra pressure? And you can create ideas on how to like go around those roadblocks or prevent them from even happening on both an individual and a group level. So those are kind of like the pre things that we can do in our comprehensive uh, package that we're putting together here. Relaxation and thought management are wonderful skills and tools to have in the moment. So something happens in the moment, say like example of me not being able to get my slides to work. And what can I do in that moment to make sure that my mind doesn't go down into this path of like, oh my gosh, this is, I just failed. Everyone's gonna think I'm a fraud, right? So I can breathe or I could reframe things. So there's many different techniques that um, help us to do these things in the moment. And we're gonna actually talk about some of them later on in this program. So the point is that we want all four of them, right? We can't just do one and think that our relationship with stress is going to shift. We really need to do all four because they work off of each other. 
And the purpose of stress management is not to eliminate stress completely, it's to redefine our relationship with stress. How can we get so uh, understanding with stress that it works for us and with us and not against us? All right, moving on. So when we do this, we create new pathways, right? So this is where neuroplasticity comes into play. If we allow ourselves to take a moment before we react, right? So if we think about that idea of like, there's that threat, right? The, the amygdala flies off the handle, tells the, hip, the hippocampus that you need to do, um, you, need, you, need to, you need to go get some help and it triggers the auto, auto nervous system to do all this stuff. If we can take a moment to stop, remind ourselves that we have maybe been in a similar situation before and we've been fine, we were safe, everything was okay, then we can choose a different thought or we can choose a different action which allows our cerebral cortex to then create a new pathway, the logic part of our brain, right? We can make an empowered decision, an empowered action, a conscious one, instead of relying on our subconscious. And when we create new pathways, it builds our brain and our resilience. So I always like to tell my uh, clients that resiliency is really just, when you get knocked off your balance or your groundedness, your stableness, how quickly can you get back to that balanced place, right? So that you're not just off, off, off your balance, right? So this quote is great. Resilience is not in invulnerability to stress, but rather the ability to recover from negative events. So how, and there's a lot of ways to do that. We can look at the event in a different way. We can um, take some mindfulness practices all of that sort of stuff to help bring us back to that balance and that place of groundedness. So we talked about how we don't want to eliminate stress completely. And part of that is because stress and peak performance, they go hand in hand. We need our sweet spot in order to get to our peak place, um, also known as flow, which that could be a whole separate webinar on what flow is and how do we get to optimal experiences. But stress is part of that. Uh, we need to find our own sweet spot, right? And for everybody, it's different. If we aren't at that sweet spot and we're like on the bottom side of the bell cur curve where we don't have enough stress in our, in, in our lives or enough um, challenge, then we could get really bored, right? And when we're bored, we become disengaged, we, uh, we start to like lose kind of passion and purpose and, and energy is just really low and down. So as our excitement and our challenge rises, we get to that sweet spot. However, if we go too far over on the bell curve where anxiety is just a little too much, um, we've become overwhelmed, all of a sudden the challenge is, is, is more than we can handle and that perceived limitations come in, right? then we get to the place where we are stressed and overwhelmed. So we wanna to try to find where our sweet spot is. And in order to do that, we kind of have to be researchers of our own selves and be curious um, on what, how far we can push ourselves and when do we need to ask for help? When do we need to come back? And one of the ways we can do that is understanding the differences of the different kinds of stress. So there are two different kinds of stress. We have eustress, which is known as the good stress. And then we have distress, which is known as the bad stress. So let's talk about eustress first. Eustress, is, it helps us stay motivated, work towards goals and feel full and abundant about our life. So with eustress, this, these are the things that are helping us to challenge us in a good way, to grow. In order for us to grow, we have to step outside of our comfort zone. And when we step outside of our comfort zone, there's going to be some fear. There's going to be maybe some worry and some anxiety. Though it's the process of navigating all of that that builds our resilience, it builds our confidence so that we get to a place where we feel good about ourselves and we've gone from maybe point A to point B. Distress is the type of stress that's bad, the kind of stress that weighs on us, that pushes us down and that keeps like breaking us down. What might be a good stress for me might not be a good stress for you, just the same way as what might be a distress for you. Maybe 
not a distress for me. So one of the examples I like to share with people is say, if you are training for a marathon, right? So training for a marathon, 26.2 miles, it's a lot of miles. And your body needs to get to a place where it can sustain that amount of impact, the stamina. Um, it's a lot of mental stuff and not just physical stuff, right? So uh, when I was first training for the, the first marathon I did, um, I didn't know a lot about running. And so I, I reached out for help and I got all these running plans. And what I realized in these running plans, the physical part of it was built so that you were incrementally adding on miles every single week, but not so much that you were putting your body into distress. So I needed to put a certain amount of stress on my muscles in my body in order to build up my muscle. But then the times that I put too much on it, or I didn't practice good self-care and stretching and getting massages and rolling out and all of that stuff, I ended up actually getting injured. So that's where we, our body goes into distress. So I find that that's sometimes a good example for people to understand how stress can actually be good. Some other examples of how like one person could look at uh, one incident that could be a possible stressor, right? So say you lose your job. So for one person, that could actually not be a huge like stressor. It could be a good stress. It could be the reason that they could finally start over and start their own business and, and fulfill their like passion and follow their dreams, right? Whereas for somebody else, that could be distress because now they don't have a way to provide for themselves or their family. Another way of using eustress in distress is seeing how can we take things that may seem at first to be distressful or a bad type of stress, how can we shift that into something that maybe is good for us? So you see this a lot of times in um, people who have who have been diagnosed with an illness, right? Like that's, ter it's terrible, it's really bad. And at first that might be really overwhelming and could bring up a lot of different issues like depression and anxiety. Though many people will also say that once they got diagnosed with their illness, that was the moment that they then started reevaluating their life and seeing what, what were their priorities? Where did they wanna put their energy? And all of a sudden they started living more in the moment, they felt more engaged and they were having a more fulfilled and empowered life than they ever imagined, right? So they took something that seemed like a bad, that, well, it is bad, <laughs> taking a bad thing, but using it for a good, um, for a good motivation. So right now, I'd like you to think of some stressors in your life. And if you have a place to be able to write them down, that would be great. Um, and I'd like you to categorize them, right? So the first thing to do in any sort of stress management is to kind of see where your stresses are coming from and how you categorize them. So I'm gonna give you a couple moments to just jot some down and you can make a, next to them, you can write good stress, bad stress, just to kind of see where things are. And in the column where you have the distress, notice if any of those might actually be some good stress. And these tools or these uh, examples that you're writing down for yourself, we're going to use them throughout the next um, part of this webinar when I teach you a couple of different tools. I'm actually going to show you five different tools. Uh, part of my philosophy is that everything comes from a holistic mind, body, spirit uh, perspective. So doing just one type of tool, whether it's a mind, like a, a mindset tool is not going to help everything, right? We have to have a balance between mindset and relaxation and prevention and all of that. So I'm going to, I'm going to teach you a few different ones today. So let's start off with the first one, which is a breath exercise called square breathing. So exactly how it sounds, we're going to do two things actually though, we're going to breathe and we're going to visualize. So visualizing is a wonderful, another skill that we can talk about for a while. And we're not gonna go in depth with it today, but we are gonna bring it into this. And what we're gonna do is as we inhale, we're gonna visualize that our inhale is going up. Then as we hold our breath, we're gonna visualize the breath coming across horizontally. And as we exhale, we're gonna visualize the breath coming down. And then as we pause at the bottom, we're going to visualize our breath, breath coming across to complete the square. 
So I find when doing breath exercises that closing my eyes is a, uh, the best way for me to do it, but that may not be the best way for you. So if that's not something that works for you, I do ask that maybe you take like a little gaze down and just kind of a soft focus. And when we take these inhales and these pauses and exhales, we're gonna do it on a four count. So again, thinking of that idea of square. All right, so I'm gonna lead you through two rounds and the third round you're gonna do on your own. So closing your eyes, if that's okay with you or finding a soft focus, begin by inhaling through your nose on a four count. One, two, three, Four, and as we pause, we visualize the line going horizontal across one, two, three, four, and then we exhale out the nose. One, two, three, four, and we pause, completing the square. One, two, three, four. Again, inhale, two, three, four, and pause, two, three, four, and exhale, two, three, four, and pause, two, three, four. Doing one more on your own time. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And one of the things that I love about square breathing is it just brings everything back to a centered place. Really feeling everything, if it feels like it's all out, of, out and floating, it can bring it all right back. And you can do this anywhere and at any time, you don't have to close your eyes, but that idea of just slowing down your breath and you controlling it, knowing that you always have control over your breath. Because a lot of times when we get stressed out, it's because we feel like we don't have control. And there are certain things we can control in life and there are many things we cannot control in our life. So how can we be okay with that? And breathing really helps us to do that. So the next tool I'm gonna to share with you is called the ABCDE technique. And this was developed by a psychologist named, named Albert Ellis. And he does a lot of work on anxiety. And his thought about anxiety is that we have, it's a function of irrational beliefs. Um, that we believe that we always have to be completely adequate, that we have to always be looking for approval from the outside, and that when things don't go the way that we want them to, it's a catastrophe, right? So that's kind of like what happens in our head. So he developed this technique, and this technique helps us to get clear on like what are these irrational beliefs so that we can examine them, and then we can change them reframe them in some way, and then we can focus more on the positive consequences of the actions that we can take from there. So what I'd like you to do is take one of those things that you wrote down earlier, um, or if a new one comes to mind, think of a time or think of a thing uh, that routinely gives you stress and write that down. And the first part about this is thinking about the activating agent. So identify the stressor. So for you, when you're looking at like what always brings you stress, identify what is that stressor. And you can write this down. Usually I like writing it down so I can see it. Um, it's also a form of journaling and journaling is a great way um, to understand ourselves more deeply so that we can go from A to B in wherever we want to be in our life. So the second thing is your belief system. So you wanna identify any e, uh, rational and irrational beliefs that may be around this stressor. Uh, so maybe an example, going back to the uh, job example, right? Being in an interviewer or, or the idea of like, I wanna get a new job. I don't like my job, I need a new job, but it gives me a lot of stress because how am I gonna find another job, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what's the belief system there? Well, identifying the rational beliefs. Well you know, I need money. Um, so just quitting my job right now might not be great. 
but my irrational beliefs, I'm going to be stuck in this job forever. Or if I leave this job, I'm, I'm never going to find another job that's great. You know, all those sorts of things. Then the third part is consequences. So what are some of the mental, physical, and behavioral consequences of these beliefs, right? So if I'm continuing to have these beliefs, um, what's happening to myself? Well, mentally, maybe I'm getting really bogged down, right? So then physically, it's making me really tired. And behaviorally, it means that I kind of just veg out on the couch, right? Or um, I'm not maybe taking care of myself in terms of like going out and running or or eating better maybe than I eat differently. So be able to look at your list and really be honest with yourself. What are some of the consequences of these beliefs that you are ha having in all three of those care, uh, categories? And then the fourth part of this is to dispute those irrational beliefs. So I kind of mentioned before that with fear, we uh it's this inner critic that comes up so there's a lot of books and and research on this idea of inner critic i call it the gremlin um and it's all this like chatter in our head right which is called self-talk so self-talk is anything that we say out loud or to ourselves and we usually put them in three different categories positive instructional and negative um and a lot of times that gremlin is there is that negative self-talk. And then, so we kind of want to lessen the gremlin and we want to pump up or amplify our cheerleader. Where the gremlin kind of gets a bad reputation though, is that like the gremlin is usually doing it to try to protect ourselves. So usually the way it's trying to protect ourselves is saying like, you're not good enough, or what if you fail, or people are going to laugh at you. And so then it keeps us small, right? Uh, so if we can really write out these irrational fears and see what this, this gremlin is saying to us, our inner critic is saying to us, and maybe where those came from, because a lot of times these limiting beliefs are not ones that we decided for ourselves. We took them on from our environment, from what society taught us, from what our parents taught us, what school taught us, the right way to do something, all of that. And so how can we dispute those irrational beliefs and make beliefs that really align with who we are and the values that we have for ourselves. So take a little moment to write some of those down. And some of the questions that you can ask yourself for D are over here on, on the right side of your screen of what facts are there, if any, to support this belief. Um, the second question being, is it a rational or an irrational belief, right? So where's that coming from again? So we're doing a really big deep dive in where is this coming from? So I grew up as a performer and uh, one of the things that always kind of stopped me was this limiting belief that like I didn't have a good singing voice. And I remember that there was this thought that kept coming up in my head that I was told when I was younger, I have a younger sister that, um, my mom, I remember saying at one point, uh, oh, your sister will get by on her singing. Stephanie, you'll get by on your acting. And I interpreted that statement as, oh, I don't have a good singing voice, which was actually not true. Like, that's a completely irrational belief, though I carried that with myself all throughout the year. I mean, I still do to some extent. No matter how many times people would be like, no, you have a great voice, you have a great voice. All I heard in my head was, oh, no. I, I don't, like, I, I'm not going to get by on my singing, right? And there was never the intention from my mom to say I wasn't a good singer. There was no ill will there or no um, malicious intention that she, in her way of saying that. But I held on to that belief for so long, so much so that when I would go into auditions, I would lose my voice at times. Um, and so really that shows also the connection between the mind and the body, that when we believe something so much, it, it manifests in our body in different ways. And that's what happens with stress too. So if this thought is coming and you're getting worried and worried and it's becoming anxious and stuff, it lives in your body. Maybe it's in the form of like shoulder tension. Maybe it's in the form of back tension. Maybe it's that pit in your stomach. So then you have stomach problems, right? So when we get in tune with our body and we actually get curious about what our body is telling us, we then can sometimes understand 
what's happening in our brain and we can ask ourselves, where is this coming from? So there's that, that symbiotic relationship and we are a full system, like I said, mind, body and spirit. So then the last part of this is effect. So what changes, what, what change the consequences, right? Like if I change my thought belief and my beliefs and my thoughts, what's possible, right? So I always ask myself like, What's actually possible in this situation? Instead of me thinking, oh my gosh, I'm never gonna get this job or I'm always gonna be stuck in the job that I don't like, right? What's possible either within my own job right now that can help bring me to another place or what's possible if I leave my job? So we're kind of shifting the energy from being this like negative low frequency energy to a higher, more open, optimistic energy an energy of possibility. All right, so we're gonna move on to another um, tool here. Maybe, here we go. Um, and this one is about reframing things. So this is another uh, mindset tool. And with reframing it, we're taking the story, that limiting belief that we've been thinking about, and we're shifting it to something that uh, gives us more possibility. So another way to do this is our language, right? Or asking questions about our situation. So an example that I love to use uh, was when I was a grad student at Teachers College. I was also working full time at a school and I was building out my coaching and consulting business. So there were many times where I felt really stressed out, really overwhelmed. And in those moments, I was like, okay, what would I say to one of my clients right now? Or what would I say to one of my students in this moment? And I started realizing that in those moments that I was so overwhelmed and stressed out, I kept saying, oh my gosh, I have to do this. And then I have to do this. And then I have to do that. And I stopped and I said, well, really, I get to do all these things. And so I started reframing everything, both in my head and the language that I was using in saying, oh, I get to read all these articles every week. I get to do this paper. I get to work on this group project. And in those little, that little, like literally one word from have to to get to opened up different possibilities for me. It allowed me to be grateful for where I was. Like, I get to do all of this. I get to go back to school. And one of the reasons I get to go back to school is because I have a full-time job that's helping me to pay for school. And then I'm also looking at it as like, oh, this is not actually bad stress. This is good stress. So thinking back to you stress, right? Like, this is allowing me to make new connections. It's allowing me to network with people. It's allowing me to... Um, uh, build up my information uh, and my knowledge on different uh, subjects and be able to build my business in a different way than I had never even thought of at that point. And these are all things that are helping me to grow both personally and professionally. So being able to reframe something allows you to not go through that downward spiral. Instead, it allows you to do the upward spiral. I'm a very visual person. So the spiral is something that I always connect to. Um, feel free to use that if it works for you, right? So I love this. I see a light in the darkness, right? Without one, there isn't the other. Um, so where can we shift our lens? Where can we shift our perspective so that we can find the next step, even if it's a small one and not bring ourselves backwards? Uh, so now the next one we're going to do, I believe, yes, is a uh, physical one. So this is called progressive relaxation. And this deals with our nerve and muscle tension. So there's a thing called bracing and bracing is unwanted, uh, unnecessary muscle tension. So many of us at desks, especially now work from home situations, um, may not be the same as the nice comfy chair we have in the office, right? We may be noticing that we have like more back issues or shoulder issues. Shoulders are a really big one for, for people or neck issues, right? So we're holding tension in our body in an unnecessary way. And when we do that, we're literally creating physical stress in the body. So it then hurts, right? And it can, it can then lead to back aches, headaches, migraines, right? Migraines sometimes come from this like physical tension we hold in our body. So if we can notice that tension, and then we have a tool to be able to relax it. So progressive relaxation works in this way, and then I'm gonna lead you through one. 
what we want to do is we're going to take muscle groups and we're going to tense them. So we're actually going to tense them as, as, as much as we can. And we're going to hold it for a moment and then we're going to release it and let it just go. And then you do that progressively moving through your body. So I actually practiced this a lot growing up as a dancer. It was a way for me to A, fall asleep at night when I found that I would be in my bed and my mind would be going. Um, so I couldn't relax in that way. And then my body just was like restless. I would start from the top and I would go through all the muscle groups all the way down to my feet. And most of the time, by the time I got down to my toes, I had fallen asleep because I wasn't all in my head because I was focused on a given task, right? So there was a mindfulness there. I was focused on something and concentrating on one thing. And then I was also physically relaxing all the muscle groups, which down the line also helped because I could, um, while I was sleeping, I was getting what I needed to rejuvenate and restore. And so it helped with injury prevention as well. So if you're sitting in a chair, like it's actually best to do this lying down, but we can also do it sitting in a chair. Make sure that your feet are uh, rooted on the ground and that you're sitting up uh, nice and tall and you can put your hands um, on your lap. So we're gonna start, this might feel a little silly, so it's fine because we can't see any of your faces. Um, you're gonna scrunch up your face, right? So we have so many muscles in our face and we don't even realize how much tension we, we uh, hold in there. So scrunch up your face as much as you can. And then you're gonna hold it there and then release it. And now scrunch up your shoulders, your upper back. Let's even get into the arms here and the fists and get as tight as you can and then release it. You also notice that there's a breath part to this. Now let's scrunch up our torso, right? So like our, our psoas, our low belly, our rib cage, all of those intercostal muscles and everything, the psoas, all of that, and really tighten it up and then release it. Now let's do just the glutes in the hip section. So like really tighten those glutes. We hold a lot of tension in our glutes, which is usually why we have low back problems and release. And now tighten those legs, both the quads and the hamstrings. Maybe let's also, because legs, when we do that, we're getting into our, our calves and our shins area. And why don't we get, well, let's leave the feet for another muscle group, but really tighten all of those and relax. And then finally tighten. Tightening all the toes, the bottom of your feet, the tops of your feet, and relax. And just for one full thing, tighten up everything in your body. Get that face in there again. And as you exhale, release. And then just sit there for a moment and just notice what's different in your body. Maybe you feel a big shift, maybe you feel a little shift, but even the littlest shift is, is progress, right? So that's progressive relaxation. And you can connect the breath to that as well. And maybe that's something you can't do fully in a meeting, right? Like if you're doing the face one, but you can do the, the arms and the legs. And the other good thing is you can notice where you hold tension in your body and then actively do the contracting and the relaxing of those muscle groups throughout the day to help loosen that part of the body. All right, so we're at our last tool for today. And um, this one is the power of creativity. So creativity is something we all possess. We might not feel like we're all creative beings, but we really are all creative beings. And by tapping into our creativity, it allows us to be better problem solvers, um, better critical thinkers. It allows us to brainstorm and collaborate more effectively and efficiently with people. It helps us to tap into our inner child and really be able to play, right? So play is a big part of flow and peak performance. Um, and many times as adults and as we get older, we lose that, we lose our sense of play, we lose our sense of wonder and curiosity. And so there are ways for us to tap into our creativity. And one of them is um, coloring. And so I specifically chose a mandala coloring exercise and you can find these online, like you just Google and print out one. And one of the things I love about this is that 
with mandala work, there's a lot of repetition, right? Um, and when you look at it at first, it seems really overwhelming. Like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do all of this? Uh, but you get to make choices, right? And every choice is a great choice. Like there's no one right way to do it. And there's definitely no wrong way to do it. And so being able to like choose colors and design, you're tapping into that creative nature. And then the physical act of, of coloring it all in is just meditative and therapeutic, right? You're, you're allowing yourself to just focus on a task right? And it kind of seems like a mundane task. So you're able to clear everything else out. And so there's also different types of um, adult coloring books out there, though. I don't know why we need to choose between adult or kid books. You can get a kid coloring book. Um, but being able to access your creativity is really important because when we don't tap into our creativity, then we're not accessing our full potential. All right, so before we wrap up today, I do want to talk about the power of practice and paying attention. So with anything in life, like if you are an athlete and uh, you go to play a game, uh, most likely if you're not at practice, you're not going to be put in the game, right? Because the, the purpose of practice is to routinely go over skills, um, whether it's learning your routes or uh, drills or getting your stamina up, all of that is important so that when you get into the game, all of that is there for you and you just get to go and play, right? Another sort of flow idea right there. So the same goes with stress management, um, mental performance, any of that, we need to practice it. And it's not just like practicing something, it's actually taking intentional practice and commitment. So really key is that intentional part. Um, and so, what are we practicing, right? Are we practicing the limiting beliefs over and over again? Because guess what? Saying that worrying thought or that inner critic thought or allowing the anxiety to kind of get out of control, then we're practicing something. So what are we choosing to practice? And how can we intentionally practice something that's going to work for us and not against us? And it's something you have to do every day over your whole life. It doesn't just stop miraculously one day. And the other part is the power of paying attention, right? So when we put our attention to something, that's where our energy goes. Energy, attention, attention, energy. So if our attention is going to all the negative things or the things that are not going to work out, guess what? That's where our energy is also going to go, right? We're going to notice all of the negative things. We're going to notice all the things that are not going to work out. And sometimes that's important. Like when, like I said, when you are goal setting and you are creating like a project or a map for your team or yourself, you want to know where some of these roadblocks may be. And so you're intentionally looking at those. But if every single time something comes up in your life and you're always looking at the more negative frequency things, then that's where your attention is gonna go. And guess what? We are ego minded people and we wanna create, we wanna make sure that we're always right. So we're always gonna find that thing where if we can shift our attention to what if, what's possible, what am I learning from this? What can I do from here, right? Then our energy is gonna shift to those, to opportunity, to abundance. So the more that we become conscious, right? And we live from a conscious place and we up-level our consciousness, the more freedom we have to choose. And when you get to choose where, you, like what you're doing and where you're doing it and, and the why and the how behind it, you then start creating empowering action and you start living an engaged life. So I created the 21 Day Stress Management Workbook. It's a holistic guide to redefining your relationship with stress. And I decided I wanted to create this a few years ago because myself, I was starting to get really overwhelmed by these different stress management tools or programs. When I did my yoga training, they were like, make sure you meditate every day and then practice yoga and all this. And actually all of that made me even more overwhelmed. Um, and so I wanted to create something that would be easy, easily digestible for anybody. Something that you could do both in and out of the workplace. Because like I said, you need to be doing something every day to manage your stress and to redefine that relationship. So I came up with 21 different tools. Um, actually, the tools I taught you today, none of them are in here. So there's 21 more tools in this book. And the purpose of it is to be able to test them out and to really just practice at least one of them every day. And it's set up that uh, it tells you the tool. It tells you how long it should typically take. So none of them are more than 10 minutes. 
um, and they range anywhere from one to 10 minutes. You rate your stress level at the beginning of the practice and at the end of the practice. There's a place for journaling and reflection. And then you get to rate it at the bottom. Like I really like a five meant I really loved this exercise or a two is like, yeah, that didn't really work for me. And then there's a little quote at the bottom because I just love quotes. And the idea is that once you finish the 21 days, you can go back and pick maybe the four or five that really resonated with you and create your practice from there. Um, the other thing I noticed is that what works for me may not work for you. And what works for me on one day may not work for me the next day. There's no one size fits all when it comes to stress management. And so here, this book empowers you to have 21 different tools that you can put into your toolbox. And the way that I broke it down is I created these seven different categories. So we have the breath, we have the mind, we have the body, perspective, so that's the idea of reframing things, um, visualization, uh, the creativity aspect, and then values, right? So really understanding our values helps to, uh, values can be a compass and can help us to determine what's working and what's not working. Um, so you can see some of them right there. So I think that about wraps it up for right now. Um, and so we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. So we have some time for some Q&A. So if you have any questions for Stephanie, please feel free to submit your questions in the questions pane, which would be focused on your right hand of the screen. So we have some questions already, Stephanie. So the first one is, what tips do you have for when you're going through a transition in your life to kind of help manage that stress? Mm, yeah, transition. So um, it's fine. So I teach dance uh, as well as do coaching and consulting. And the thing that I tell all of my students is that transitions are actually the most interesting part of any dance. So I think the first thing is to get curious about what you're telling yourself about a transition. Um, what are some of the thoughts that come up when the word transition comes up? Uh, get curious to like, what are you feeling both in your body and what stories is, it are, is connected, are connected to those feelings? Um, so that'd be the first thing that I would say. Um, I don't wanna impose anything though. I think a lot of times when we say transitions, People, are, people get really nervous and scared that's like, oh, I don't know what my next step is and I always need to know what I'm doing, right? Um, and so that's, that's kind of a limiting belief. And if that's what's coming up, you can do that ABCDE technique and say like, is that belief really working for you? Could I reframe this and be like, wow, in a transition, I can do anything and everything. I have so many options. And then choose one and go for it, right? Um, I think sometimes the fear of failure comes up in transitions of like, oh, if I choose this one thing and it doesn't work out, then I'm a failure, right? Um, I was actually just in a uh, webinar that I was a participant of right before this one today. And we were talking about that idea of fear of failure and the fact that failure is actually, if we can reframe it to be feedback, then every time we fail and we should be failing often and quickly and and getting back up we can say okay what did i learn from that what do i want to take from that okay it's feedback now let's take this next step so i hope that helped thank you and i think that's so important stephanie about making sure like failure is not always a bad thing sometimes you need to fail to reframe it and then help you progress in your life so the next yeah. question i have is you generously talked about the 21 days of different stress management. I know sometimes I get so busy in a day that I completely forget to have lunch or take a sip of water. How do you make sure that we are mindful about taking at least 10 minutes a day to practice these various exercises? Mm. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's a great question. So part of it becomes like your commitment, right? So when I ask, but when we want to make change, we have to be bought in ourselves, right? So when I'm working with a client and they're like, well, I want to change this and I want to do this, I'll ask, well, how committed are you to doing this? Because if we're not committed, no one can make you do anything, right? You have to do it yourself. So really getting honest with yourself, like what am I committed to doing and how much time am I going to commit to that? So if 10 minutes is too much, that's totally fine. Can you commit 
two minutes of a breathing exercise and do that for a week and then notice what shifts are happening. And then maybe you're like, oh, this is really great. Let me add a little more to that, right? So um, it's, a, it's a lot like goal setting, right? So we have these like big goals and sometimes that can be really overwhelming. How can we pare it down to small steps that we are committed to doing? And then the more that we do it, we actually get more confident and confidence in ourselves to continue to go forward. And that's then again, when resilience comes in, right? So that like, maybe you skip a day. And instead of maybe before being really hard on yourself for skipping a day, you've gotten to a point where you're like, oh, it's okay, I'm being gentle myself. I'm totally okay that I skipped a day. What do I wanna do tomorrow? Great, thank you. So earlier you were talking about the fight, flight, and freeze. Sometimes we have the mindset of like, when stress happens, we immediately pick flight or freeze. How do we change our mindset to be one over the other? Yeah, so I'll say that like, it shows up in different ways for different people, right? So, um, and you have to be get, more clarity on like how it shows up for you and different stressors are going to do different things for you. Um, and so I always just say like, get curious, get curious. And to me, the first thing, and I'll speak from an eye perspective here, the first thing I do when I feel that that's happening and it's literally a physiological response. So, um, like people, when they freeze, they'll tense, right? There'll be that bracing. If, uh, they are flight, if, like, uh, lighting away <laughs> if they're running away that's avoiding right so if you're in a conversation with somebody and they say something to you that kind of like triggers you and you just avoid it that's that is your fight flight or freeze coming in the fight part like something somebody says something in a meeting and you immediately have to jump on it right so noticing what how it comes up for you and it's going to come up for everybody once you get clear on how it comes up for you, you then have the ability, because you then have the power, because you're conscious aware of it now, to make a different choice. And for me, the first choice I do is breathing, right? So because when, because I, I can control my breath, right? So I feel it in my body. I'm like, oh gosh, it's happening. All right, let me breathe. Maybe it's square breathing. Maybe it's three-part yogi breath. Maybe it's some other type of breath, right? And then from there, what do I want to do now? Do I really need to like, jump back on that person and say what I need to say? Is that really going to get the reaction I want? Am I avoiding right now? Oh, I am avoiding. So how can I bring myself back into an engaged place? If it's the freeze thing, then it's like, oh, how can I just relax a little more and get clear on what's happening around me? So for me, I go straight to the, the breath, but it really is being curious and being your own little researcher of how these different things show up in your life. And all of them do. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So the next question we have is sometimes in the workplace, I just find myself being pulled in multiple directions without any breaks. And sometimes I just need just a pause before I pivot to the next project. How do we set boundaries in spaces like the workplace to respectfully ask for time to take care of myself so I can go from one thing to the next thing? Yeah, so it's funny because before you said boundaries, I was thinking, oh, boundaries that would be great here. So with boundaries, um, first of all, the idea of boundaries, like for me growing up, like I had a really bad relationship with that word. And then I realized, oh, boundaries are an act of self-love. They are an act of self-care, right? So when we start thinking about them in that way, then it's just advocating for ourselves, right? It's, it's being able to set up um procedures with maybe your boss or your employees to help them understand that by you saying that you are worth self-care and self-love by having these boundaries so are they right um and being a, and kind of leading by example so um a lot of times you know we hear everyone just eats at their desk right and they don't take a moment to get up and do something else fine that's what people want to do that's okay but how can you find a boundary in a different way? Can you get up and take a walk around? Can you shut your door at one moment? Maybe it's the same time every day. Maybe you block off on your calendar that for 20 minutes at three o'clock, that's when you take time to put on your favorite song or do a little meditation or stand up and do some light stretching. 
right? And then everyone knows that at three o'clock, you do not open Stephanie's door, right? And then it's reminding yourself that you deserve to have that time and staying committed to it. And then honoring other people's boundaries as well. Thank you. I think that's just so important, making sure, especially now more than ever, just keeping track of our mental health and making sure we set time for your, ourselves instead of just everyone always. So thank you. So I know we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, but Stephanie is, uh, has her contact information on the next slide. So if we didn't get to your question or you have a question that you haven't been able to put in the Q&A box, please feel free to reach out to Stephanie. Um, there is her email address as well as her website. Stephanie, I just want to thank you so much for showing us various ways to help manage our stress. I'm pretty sure I can speak for all of the participants, but I know I feel extremely relaxed right now. So thank you. We really Great. appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with the TC community. TC will be planning more digital events in the near future. So please stay tuned to your emails from TC, alumni relations, as well as our social media channels. You will be receiving a link to this video recording and a follow-up email, and it will also be available on our website. We hope you can join us for our next event, Music and Arts Maker Session with alumna Jamie Solis on Thursday, July 9th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful day.